or bad. bad. Then, then at, at the end, end after, after counting, counting the goods and bads, I'm, I'm going to tell you the final board, if it's good or bad. bad. Okay? So, so please, please be sure to say clearly if it's good or bad. I don't want to be in the middle, maybe taking my own position if it's good or bad. So be clear what's your position. Anyway, let me introduce you these speakers. We have Dr. Eduardo Rios Neto. Uh, with a PhD from demography at the University of California, Berkeley. Currently, he is professor and director of demography at Sede Plar Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil, and distinguished Lehman professor at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. His renowned demography specializes on development, economics, labor economics, and fertility, with grounding breaking research on fertility and economics. Then, We'll have the arguments of Dr. Sathar, Seba Sathar, which is a PhD, has a PhD in medical demography from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She heads the Population Council as country director in Pakistan, advises and assists the government of Pakistan in formulating population policies and programs. And recently, she was the co-lead of the Peace FP 2020 Performance Monitoring and Evidence Working Group and he's an innovative demographer in the area of fertility and reproductive health. Then we will have Dr. Eric Ujo, who holds a doctorate degree in demography from the University of London. For many years, he was responsible for demographic analysis at the Statistical Office of South Africa. He is professor and head of the demography research division at the Bureau of Market Research at the University of South Africa. He is a well-known expert on fertility and mortality with pioneering research on these topics focusing on Africa and has received several awards for his outstanding research. Last but not least, we have Dr. Wendy Siegel with PhD in economics from Brown University and currently professor of gender and family studies. It is not a normative one, it's rather an analytic one. Uh, Coming from Latin America, uh, in the 70s, we were all against family planning intervention. We would call them neo Malthusian uh, interventionists up until, let's say, Cairo, when you start to see that there was a latent demand for family planning, and we moved uh, from uh, this criticism to recognizing women's reproductive health and rights. So I take uh, this side of the debate on a rights perspective. And the idea is that uh, you have to respect the rights and the choices that women make. Uh, the facts behold, behind low fertility, I think, uh, uh, the, the most, most important, important point now is to see and recognize that low fertility is a post-fertility transition phenomenon who took place in developed countries but is already taking place in several middle-income countries and postponement, some people say postponement transition is what is actually taking place. So just as an example of that, you can see uh, the countries with the largest rise in the rise through time in the mean age at first birth, uh, with as an indicator of this postponement transition. Um, also, you have uh, other regions, as I said, in developing countries, Korea is mentioned there, I'm not going to read what's there, as a special case where you had both parity and cohort fertility decline and postponement, but even in Brazil, my case I'm studying, we are clearly entering the fertility postponement transition right now. Um, regarding cohort fertility, Cohort fertility is a little bit higher. Uh, I apologize for making this contest because that, that's the ground for the justification of my position. 
So cohort fertility is higher than period fertility, but even so, is a little bit low, what would be a replacement level, and in some places, uh, co even cohort fertility is declining a lot. So uh, those are the facts. And the last fact that I would wish to point is the so-called uh, G-shape as human development progresses, you eventually reach rising fertility. So moving from facts that fertility should be high, I would do this kind of confusion, which is we always fought in Latin America when we had the fights with the neo Malthusian controllistas back in the 60s. So uh, we have uh, gender equity, uh, McDonald's, uh, comparison and contrast between individual and family-oriented institutions, and then low fertility would be, fertility would be low in countries when you reach equity in individual institutions, but you do not uh, reach equity in family institutions. Similarly, we have uh, Spin Anderson and Billary explanation. In a way, it's like the breadwinner model was kind of a Parsonian model, and gender equity would bring a new functionalist Parsonian model, and both are correlated with high fertility, and low fertility would be a disequilibrium stage. So my view, my take on that is, again, you may fight for better family institutions, gender-oriented family institutions. You may fight for gender egalitarianism, and of course I'm in favor of that, but trying to rise fertility per se without addressing the cause would be a mistake. Uh, another important factor be behind low fertility is education, female education, more so women's tertiary education. And again, I'm gonna move fast for the sake of brevity, I'm running out of time, but uh, the point is that women's tertiary education is associated with postponement, with the postponement transition, and also with cohort fertility, with quantum fertility. But again, uh, it's hard to say that you would wish to raise fertility for this segment of women, which is the most democratic one, and if they have that choice based on the constraints, you should address the constraints and not the dependent variable. Um, finally, you have the negative exter externality of low fertility, and I'm focusing on social security. So the idea is that Low fertility and below replacement fertility favor population aging, and so we would try to rise fertility on an externality kind of argument. And uh, my criticism on that is that it's kind of fallacious because even if you rise fertility, you would rise fertility at the most to the replacement level, and that does not create uh, uh, Sam Wilson's uh, positive rate of return on a pay-as-you-go kind of social security. So it's not going to do the trick. And actually, there is a paper by Wolfgang Lutz and, and Strisnik and Lutz that shows that women's education may rise uh, children's education and the quality of the children. And if you weight the support ratio by this education, uh, his exercise shows that uh, optimum uh, rate, uh, optimum fertility rate is actually below replacement. So if you take the trade-off between child quality and child quantity, you would be in favor of below replacement. So my general conclusion, finally, is that low fertility is good for society because it's the outcome of personal decisions, not only women's, 
but also another kind of identity-driven arrangements like living alone and LGBT options. And there is no point in violating these rights just for the sake of raising fertility in society. So that's a, it's a non-normative, analytic, right-oriented kind of argument. So thank you. Seba Sattar is going to speak against that is bad fertility law. Very bad. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, when I accepted Fatima's, thank you very much, Fatima, and it's really an honor to be part of this distinguished panel and in this very distinguished audience. I accepted Fatima's invitation for this debate uh, basically based on decades of friendship that we've had, and I thought we'd have a lot of fun. However, really, uh, and on honestly, when I started my preparation for this event, I led myself into some sort of uh, an existential crisis. Many of the, we'll watch some of the, uh, many of the theoretical underpinnings about the demographic transition, uh, about gender equity, societal transformation, that had been so firmly entrenched in my mind by uh, uh, teachers and colleagues, um, really turned out really turned on their head, and I must tell you that I found it very, very unsettling. These were solid truths that I'd imbibed during my formative years uh, in training in demography, and based on volumes of research by our gurus like Ansley Cole, Colwell, Van Der Waal, uh, to name just a few. And I thought that the only theory that we did were c confirmed, that was confirmed in our teaching was really that all societies would transition from this high fertility, high mortality to low, mortality, low fertility and no mortality. Um, and that basically in the end, um, as the magical figure of 2.1, which we tried to show in this uh, you know, happy journey, uh, was a magical figure where everyone uh, would be satisfied. Societies, family, children, we'd reach replacement fertility, a balance would be struck, it would sounded like a comfortable ideal and a very happy ending, implying lasting equilibrium for families and society. But then comes all what we are learning from and many of the sessions at this conference about what's happening in Europe now extending to Southeast Asia. We see more and more countries experiencing fertility lower than two point children and the new sort of demographic crisis and the happy ending to me doesn't look so happy after all. In fact, I would say it actually begs a revisit of how we uh, reconstruct demographic transition theory. Now, I was asked to talk about the impact on gender, and Karen Mason and many colleagues in this room, we did like a five-year project um, really studying status of women, many of the measures that now go into the standard DHS, and we really firmly believe that actually the low status of women, at least in Asian societies, was a major reason for low fertility. And as fertility fell and education and employment opportunities expanded, so the status of women would automatically and necessarily change, improve, there would be gender equality. Uh, and women, you know, the, they would have more power to make the decisions uh, when to marry, whether to marry, the timing of uh, a number of pregnancies. So it all was really comfortable sort of studies that we did and we expected everything to fall into place. But then again, as I said, what we see is this um, lower fertility happening in so many societies and very low fertility in particular, but that in many of these societies, gender relations, gender violence, uh, gender relations tend to be just the same. There's still gender violence. There are sex selective abortions. There are asymmetrical roles and responsibilities in child rearing. And the images of uh, having a super mom that combines all these roles continues even with low fertility. So I would like to argue against what uh, Eduardo just um, talked about. In fact, that I think low fertility can be quite stressful for girls and women and does not necessarily assure their full rights. This is what I'll try and do in the next couple of minutes. 
Um, essentially, of course, I do think that one truth has unfolded. Labor force participation rates, you talked to that point, have gone up. So in a way, they have opened up the whole idea, the emancipation from child uh, bearing as the only option for women and the traditional opportunities that men monopolized um, have really opened up for women. There is no doubt an emerging pathway for self-realization for women. But it was all the other things that were supposed to accompany this comfortable sort of, uh, you know, that should have followed that haven't happened. And this new crisis where women in low fertility societies have, I'm sure, good reasons that we need to study more and, and no interest in both marriage and childbearing. It's become a bit of a, a you know, a res expanding research agenda. Uh, I looked at work, and I'm very glad Peter McDonnell is here because somehow looking at his work gave me some solace. There is some explanation, I think. Um, it seems like he had, um, when I looked at Southern and Northern Europe, I saw that there is an explanation why uh, women in the southern countries are really going for this free fall, you know, to very, very low fertility, mainly because their, their roles haven't changed. The family-friendly policies haven't really happened there, and the work uh, maternity balance, therefore, is out of balance, so to speak, in contrast to northern European countries, which have had a long tradition of family-friendly institutional arrangements, and so they have, in a way, prevented this free fall into very low fertility, which is, I think, not good. Um, but then I look, when we look at Japan, Singapore, Korea, and China, the big countries outside Europe, who are now, you know, they are also experiencing very low fertility, um, I see that the rigidity of cultural norms that really don't change the, 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 the responsibilities of childbearing make this paradox of very low fertility coexisting with gender inequity very, very obvious. Um, so this is my main argument. Um, I want to, uh, you know, really sort of bring this home. Who is more stressed, let's say, the women, let's say in Pakistan or India or Nepal, et cetera, who, or in sub-Saharan Africa, who are really having, they feel the stress because of unwanted pregnancies. They're having more children than they really want because of low autonomy or lack of services or lack of mobility, et cetera, or women who are now wanting to probably have few more children than they're really actually happening, having, and they feel that they're really letting down their families and society by not having children at all. And I do want to argue that I think the latter is much worse pressure. So essentially, I think that the crisis is that the policies that are being discussed at this conference, and I know a lot in other conferences, uh, I think will not, the economic incentives are not going to really succeeding in bringing women back, uh, giving, giving up uh, lifestyle choices, and above all, the independence that they've really achieved in places like Spain, Italy, and Japan. Um, and I think that the lesson learned for us who worked in this area of gender is really basically that um, lowering fertility has to come with more profound changes in gender roles and responsibilities than just expanding education and employment opportunities. This is really, I think, uh, a lesson learned for many of the countries who approach uh, 2.1. Now, let me move to the second thing uh, we were supposed to talk about is really whether very low fertility is good or bad for families. Well, look at that poor lonely child, you know, I mean, <laughs> I thought the picture would. Um, so I, since I probably have overdone my time, I would say that, again, uh, grounded in our work uh, that showed that really, based on microeconomic theories, that situating fertility choices in household economy, economics, that basically parents had fewer children because they were going to produce good quality children. But I would like to argue, mainly because for the case of the debate, that this is not necessarily a guaranteed picture. I think that uh, we have to weigh the sort of quantitative aspects of quality, of choice, et cetera, of having fewer children, with really other non-quantifiable aspects. Uh, does a mother, d for instance, I'll ask this question, is the lonely child here who's a loner at most times while his or parents uh, you know, go out to work really happier than the one growing up with lots of siblings, cousins, aunties, and uncles? 
uh, no, I think that, you know, you, you, I, I think that we have to study this uh, much more. The other very negative uh, dimension, I think, of low fertility, and I'm being really serious about this one, is the widespread practice of sex-selective abortions. Not yet, actually, I'm not going to do that. Um, especially in Southeast Asia and parts of India. I think these societies experiencing very low fertility, but still stuck with the age-old gendered issues of having more sons to continue the family name, the obvious sort of things that go along, uh, really force them to make these very, very drastic choices and things like sex-selective abortion are, I would argue, uh, not good for child welfare, whether we talk about the welfare of uh, girls or boys growing up in a society which has uh, sex imbalances. Um, and I, on my last, if you allow me two or three more minutes, uh, Fatima is really the third slide um, about whether very low fertility uh, is a good or bad for society. Here I have lots of ammunition, I must say, because I think that uh, all the policies from what I gather, um, I mean, there's this frenzied activity of striking the right policy chords to reverse trends to low fertility in Europe, in Southeast Asia, and even places like uh, Iran, uh, where there is concern about reversing replacement fertility. Um, you know, I think this is where the state, the family, and individuals, mainly women, do come into a clash. So I don't think that's uh, very good so for society. Because I think if we, are t we are worrying about society, then we are really not concerned about the, the rights of women, um, and I don't think this makes for uh, a very healthy situation. But let me tell you about, um, you know, basically the other existential crisis that I had while preparing for this talk was that we in uh, South Asia and particularly in Pakistan and Sub-Saharan Africa are using the demographic dividend as a tool and successfully, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, I know recently work with the African Union, to convince high-level policy makers about the benefits of a demographic dividend, about uh, expediting fertility decline to actually see the bulging labor force, take, take advantage of the large labor force, and see uh, uh, an increase in savings and, of course, um, increase in per capita incomes. There are models that show that. I think we've been fairly successful in convincing policy makers. But the crisis that I had was that I think we have deliberately blinkered our, our, our argument for the case sake of advocacy. And what weakens our advocacy is when we see what's happening um, in Europe and in Southeast Asia, which are much, uh, they're much richer regions and they are facing crisis of how to deal with old age pensions and the shrinking of the labor force. So unfortunately, countries like Pakistan and Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, which are the last, will be the last to reap the demographic dividend, are likely to fe face the worst, I think, economic challenges with limited tax bases, very little fiscal space, and no preparation, actually, for an aging population. So I think that that is really going to be a problem, um, you know, for, for uh, countries like ours. But the final uh, point I want to make is, and I think it's, I hope it's going to be the nail in the coffin to win our side of the debate. I think is that increasingly, there are clear dilemmas facing most of Europe, and I think Southeast Asia, in how to deal with issues, particularly of a shrinking labor force. Migration laws and the large influx of political refugees, particularly, require a total rethink about liberal values, uh, and racial discrimination. They don't like my, my words, I think. Anyway, and as incoming migrants um, basically are most likely to have higher fertility than the host population. Their influx, which ought to be welcome for contributing to the labor force, especially in jobs that are being rejected by the host shrunk, shrinking labor force, are not necessarily seen as a positive thing. And I think what dominates thinking um, is really, whether it's implicit or explicit, is really the fear of a changing racial profile. I think this need not be this way, but I think as Dr. Zuberi said in his keynote address, this final demographic, he called it, the, I think, the final demographic racial transition has thus led far too 
basically to a conflict situation, which is definitely not good for societies. Thank you. Eric will talk now in favor of low fertility. Good afternoon, colleagues. <coughs> um, when I received the invitation to participate in this uh, debate, it was like Fatima was taking me back to the early 1980s uh, when I was doing my master's because it reminded me of uh, some of the courses uh, that I did outside the demographic uh, techniques courses, reminded me of courses like sociology of fertility, economics of population change, where they talk about the cost-benefit analysis of having an extra child, family planning and evaluation, biosocial aspects of reproduction. It just reminded me of those uh, courses. Uh, but today I'm not going to uh, take a th uh, theoretical perspective, but I'm going to take um, a pragmatic, a pragmatic approach. And the first thing I want to do in this regard is uh, to define low fertility as um, having one or two, ch uh, one to two children. Um, at individual level, the number of children a woman has, when you aggregate that, you know, to, for all women, uh, for the entire population, and you divide that by the number of women in the population, that translates into the average number of children, uh, average number of children uh, in the population. Uh, uh, resulting in the fertility level for that uh, population. Uh, so uh, given, that, uh, given that perspective, uh, the level of fertility has consequences at um, the individual level uh, for women and also for society as a whole. Uh, one of the dis uh, uh, distinguishing demographic features of uh, developed and less developed countries is the level of fertility. Uh, in the more developed countries, uh, they're they characterized by a total fertility rate of uh, less than two, while in the less developed countries, you're characterized by total fertility that is greater than three, excluding, uh, uh, excluding China. Now, if you look at Niger on one side of the scale, it's got a total fertility rate of about 7.3 uh, in 2015, while uh, a country like Hungary in Europe has a total fertility rate of uh, 1.4 below, you know, the magic number that um, uh, Zeba was uh, talking about, 1.4. Uh, so in this debate, I'm going to argue that um, Low fertility is good at uh, family level uh, from the perspective of uh, gender and also at societal level. I'm going to look, first of all, look at why I feel it is good at uh, family level. Uh, first of all, let's look at the provision of basic needs. And by basic needs, I mean provision of uh, providing for shelter, housing, providing for food, providing for, uh, for clothing. Uh, when you look, if, if for the certainly for families that have low fertility, the provision of uh, this basic needs is um, easier than for uh, high, fertility, uh, high fertility families. So uh, when you talk about provision of uh, basic needs, and you look at in terms of the constraint on family budget. So educating children uh, is a major cost um, in the family budget. So in this, in this context, uh, families with one or two children are more likely to be able to afford quality education 
uh, at all levels for their children compared with um, families uh, with, uh, that have uh, high fertility. Again, uh, when you look at the cost of uh, medical care in welfare states, uh, the state provides for medical care, uh, but in many um, African countries, uh, the state uh, provides medical care, but within the public health system. Uh, but even then, within the public health system, it is not entirely, it is not entirely free. Now, we also know that in many African countries, the uh, healthcare system is, um, is, is in a shamble, and that uh, makes people to seek private healthcare rather than uh, going to utilize their public uh, health care. Now, in a situation like this, uh, families with uh, low fertility will be uh, are more able to provide. I mean, to to seek uh, private medical care for both for preventive and curative uh, uh, purposes. Uh, recreational activities is another aspect that I have planned my mind to. Uh, we want to take our children. We want to take our family on holiday. We want to take them to cinemas. Uh, we want to take them for body massage. <laughs> <laughs> we want to take them for opera. We want to take them for comedies and all of that. These are recreational activities. For uh, th th these recreational activities enhances, uh, they enhance the quality of life. And uh, for the adults in the family, it reduces stress, you know, occupational stress at work, and so on, and so it might have an impact on longevity. It's, it, for me, it's more as it's, 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 uh, families with low fertility are able to utilize recreational facilities or go, uh, utilize uh, recreational activities more frequently than uh, families with, uh, with high fertility because these things don't come cheap. There's a Chinese, uh, when I was going back to work, uh, coming back from uh, here yesterday, just by my hotel, I stopped over this uh, Chinese massage. Uh, and I went in to ask for the cost. 360 rands for an hour. I mean, if you are going to, if you have uh, um, a large family, you look at the opportunity cost of doing that compared to some other things that you need to spend money on. So you would think twice about, you know, going to, going to do that. From, from a gender perspective, uh, high fertility usually implies short birth intervals among children. Uh, it may also imply that women are having children at a very young age and also having children uh, to a very late uh, age. Uh, high fertility, we've read in many, in many literature that it can impact negatively on the health of the, of the mother and on the health of the on the health of the uh, on the health of the child, uh, closely spaced baths. We've read in, in books that uh, increases the risk of uh, inf uh, infant deaths. So the risk of maternal and uh, child deaths is pos potentially lower for women with low fertility compared with women with high fertility. Uh, at family level, I also want to look at uh, women's empowerment. Uh, caring for children demands a lot of time. Uh, that may be in conflict with uh, women's aspiration for education and employment. The other day, uh, I asked Fatima whether she still plays saxophone. Because when we were at the London School of uh, Hygiene, I knew she used to play saxophone. She said, no, since she had a child, she no longer plays saxophone. You know, that, <laughs> that um, you see, that, that emphasizes the point, you know, that children demand a lot, uh, demand a lot of uh, time. Uh, so low fertility provides women with greater potential uh, for education, employment, and hence women's empowerment. Uh, it provides women with uh, greater opportunity to pursue their career uh, in politics, academia, and then in the corporate world, thereby contributing to the socioeconomic sectors 
of the, of the economy outside the um, home, home care. What about a societal level? Uh, and when we look at fertility and socioeconomic development, at society, societal level, high fertility uh, fuels population growth, as we all know, and can retard economic development. Uh, since the fast growing population puts pressure on limited resources. Low fertility implies that uh, implies lower population growth, assuming that migration is not net migration is not substantial uh, in the population. So it puts less pressure on uh, a societal level, at least puts less pressure on provision of educational facilities for children, less pressure for the provision of health care for children. Uh, low fertility also enhances human capital investment and infrastructure uh, and, and development by the state. As small resources that will be used for caring for children can be diverted uh, for developing infrastructure and human capital, uh, human capital de development. Uh, also, we've been hearing, I hate, I generally shy from the word demographic dividend, you know. But again, it uh, reminds me of the, when it, any time I hear demographic dividend, it reminds me of the 1980s, you know. In, uh, uh, but, but basically what, what uh, the whole notion of low fertility results in the change in age structure, uh, this increases the proportion of youth and the working age group population. Uh, thus providing a window of, of opportunity for economic growth, provided, provided that there are strategies to create enough jobs for the increased labor force. So for these reasons, I'd like to submit that low fertility is good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now we have the arguments of Wendy. See? She will tell us that it's bad. So, um, I'm in the enviable position of agreeing with much of what everybody has, who has preceded me has said. I just might put it together slightly differently. Can I have the... So, I'm arguing... Can you move closer to the microphone? Closer to the microphone. Oh, I, bring I, it down. I don't know. Is that okay. better? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I'm arguing for the bad position, um, which I've accepted and then got really scared about arguing for. Because the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I needed to be really careful to distinguish cause and consequence. Um, as demonstrated in previous research, and I think a really good example is the recent project organized by Ron Renfis and Minja Chair very low fertility is often the consequence of institutional rigidities in the face of change. When other things that remained or had become incompatible with having children could not be successfully altered, it was childbearing that eventually adapted. So I'm assuming people want children and then they adapt to conditions that make it harder for them to have the number of children that they want. And I think the work of the project that Ron and Minja organized is really telling. They provide lots of country examples that show a range of different combinations of institutional incompatibilities and draw attention to the importance of context and the importance of variation. Um, in Korea, um, where the institution of heterosexual marriage has been slow to change and where non-marital childbearing remains stigmatized, women have retreated from or postponed traditional marriage um, as evidenced by the growing number of single marriages, which are advertised uh, in the pink advert on the slide, for people who want the portrait in the party but not the husband. Um, very low fertility can be understood as one of many consequences of rigidities in gendered institutions in that setting. My task, as I understand it, is to convince you that once fertility falls to a low level, there are additional negative consequences. And I started to get really scared about how to do that. And then I went to the grocery store and I got some inspiration. Um, I was struck by the number of products that promise to reduce your cholesterol level. Uh, the marketing success of these products relies on an important error of thinking. If your doctor tells you that your cholesterol is high, we know it's something to worry about. So a product that can reduce your cholesterol must make us healthier, right? 
Well, not exactly. High cholesterol is a surrogate marker. It's a laboratory measurement that's used as a substitute for a clinically meaningful endpoint, and that is expected to predict the effect of a therapy or intervention. Cholesterol is not a direct measure of death by heart disease, which we would like to avoid, but an easy to measure laboratory value, an indicator of poor health behavior, and a predictor of an eventual bad outcome. It is not the outcome we are ultimately interested in. The meaningful clinical endpoint is the kind of society we would like to live in. There's no evidence that reducing your cholesterol by drinking Benicol um, will reduce your risk of heart attack. They actually don't advertise that. They just tell you your cholesterol will go down. While misplaced efforts to treat the surrogate might mean that we waste money, in some instances they can be absolutely harmful. A drug called torcetrapib substantially reduces cholesterols in patients, but randomized control trials showed that it increased mortality and cardiovascular morbidity. Personally, I'd recommend you adopt a vegan diet. Um, in the world of medicine, Kirsch cautions that surrogates, thank you for the applause there, um, surrogates often take on a life of their own, far removed from the actual disease they represent. We shouldn't care if surrogates are improving, but instead look for evidence of whether and when the surrogate means better health. Like high cholesterol, I think very low fertility, similar to very high fertility as well, is often an indicator that something is unhealthy or bad or incompatible in a society. I can see that very low fertility results in harm when it becomes the policy target in and of itself, when like high cholesterol, it is treated as the meaningful endpoint. To treat the reversal of very low fertility as a meaningful endpoint is to assume that achieving a reversal by almost any means is good, and that treatment policies that achieved such a reversal can be interpreted as a success. Um, this thinking can be used to modify and justify policy interventions which prioritize a particular policy position, a, a particular population outcome at the expense of individual rights or individual well-being. Think, for example, of some of the efforts to respond to the threat of global population growth, which sometimes unabashedly dismissed or minimized the well-being of people whose fertility needed to be controlled. Or uh, the infamously pro-natalist regimes that we saw in Romania not too long ago. While I don't think many people would advocate the kinds of overtly coercive policies that were implemented several decades ago, a more passive disregard for individual well-being is not uncommon, especially when confronted with the crisis of the indicator of very low fertility. Uh, for example, Mishtal describes how policymakers in Poland uh, restricted access to birth control and sex education in the years after fertility fell to very low levels. Increasing fertility by making it more likely that people unsuccessfully avert, avert births they don't feel ready to have or able to afford, even as economic insecurity and inequality were growing, and previously generous support for families was being cut, is not something I would interpret as a success, and I certainly wouldn't consider it any sort of feminist nirvana. Uh, when the emphasis on changing fertility rates quickly without much reflection or concern about whether the effect of the intervention is beneficial to the people whose behavior is being targeted, the damage, I think, can be very difficult to reverse. Efforts to justify the manipulation of fertility behavior through policy often target women, depicting them in not very flattering ways. Women are irrational or ignorant, and their behavior is pathological or dangerous. They must be stopped. The result may be the development of mistrust in the government by people who feel angry and scapegoated by its narrative. Uh, as research carried out by my former PhD student, Joanne Marchek, suggests, once mistrust in policymakers develops, it may be difficult to win it back, even if the problem representation, low fertility is the fault of selfish and or stupid women, and the associated policies uh, the associated policy strategy changes. Um, similar to what Arlen Thornton has described in his work on developmental idealism, I think that, we, that when we, as experts, identify low fertility as a problem, seek to explain very low fertility, and help policymakers understand what they can do to reverse it, we actually shape the way that policymakers and citizens subsequently think and behave. I worry that our um, research methods and models can reinforce the impression that broad institutional change is not an option. Uh, to identify the ever-elusive causal effects of policy on fertility, our statistical models of childbearing 
and the proposed policy levers we often test typically hold constant the wider institutional constellation of policies in an effort to approach quasi-experimental conditions. Such conceptualizations implicitly legitimize a focus on silver bullet interventions, single policies. Um, and even as our cross-national comparative research documents just how different and better conditions are elsewhere, we reinforce the idea that you really can't expect big changes where you are. That, I think, creates a potentially damaging uh, mindset. And it means that people are making the choice, as Eduardo points out, to have small children, but it shouldn't be so be it. It should be why and what can we do about it? And can it be better? Um, when we use microeconomic models of rational decision making, we depict a world of constrained optimization in which bearing and raising children is always and inevitably going to be costly and disruptive for women, families, and employers. Uh, taking, uh, taking the constraints of the economy and labor market as more or less given, good parents and good employees choose the right time to have children. This conceptualization challenges depictions of women as ignorant and irrational. But it also vindicates employers who avoid hiring or retaining employees with care responsibilities. Uh, Mishtal, for example, interviewed women in Poland who reported being asked to take pregnancy tests before being offered jobs and who were asked to agree not to get pregnant for a certain period of time if they got hired. Uh, the idea that children are disruptive really kind of vindicates that kind of behavior. And we see that kind of logic reflected in other parts of the world when we see marketing campaigns for egg freezing and the statements of global corporations that subsidize their costs, often up to $20,000 an employee. The optimal strategy for smart women and good employees is to freeze your eggs and displace your reproduction to a more economically unproductive stage of the life course. A society where caring and family responsibilities are so inconvenient and so incompatible with the labor market is not really one that gets my vote. Um, against a backdrop of rising inequality and economic insecurity, our export discourses construct a high stakes game in which the victory condition, stable employment and some level of economic security is compromised by childbearing and where preparing children for their own high stakes competition in the future requires high levels of investment in their quality. Eventually, my fear is, as Mishtal argues happened in Poland, very strategic thinking about the timing of family events and having only one child becomes a marker of responsible parenthood and middle-class status. Rather than challenge the child-unfriendly environment, the only option is to continue to adapt to it. And as higher status women make these adaptations and frame their behavior positively to one another, um, they may well diffuse more widely. When we see family and childbearing behavior as part of a competitive strategy with the risks of getting it wrong um, attributed to the bad or good decisions of individuals, I worry that this can erode a sense of social solidarity and a sense of collective responsibility for children. Your children, your good or bad decision, your responsibility. Again, not a society that gets my vote. Uh, to summarize my argument, and I'm only about 10 seconds over, very low fertility can have additional detrimental consequences. I think it's often the result of something that is a little bit wrong in society, but it can have additional consequences when it's treated as a meaningful endpoint, something that needs to be changed by whatever means, and as a consequence, we lose sight of what the meaningful endpoint should be, the kind of society we want ourselves and our children to thrive in. When the circumstances which allowed low fertility um, to fall to very low levels are left unaltered, made more invisible or taken for granted, the negative effects of the institutional rigidities and negative consequences of the institutional disequilibrium that generated very low fertility in the first place will persist and have the potential to do more and lasting harm. So thank you very much. We have arguments in favor, against, and now we have, can, can you put like 
two minutes, two minutes, two minutes for each speaker. I mean, I'm not gonna be that rigid, but you know, like if you go to five, yes, I'll stop you. <laughs> so um, if you want to take either side of the microphone, just say your name, your affiliation, good or bad, and then I take count here, you know? So please start, you can have. We can start with this side okay. first and then for the left, yes. High fat, lower fertility is bad for the society. Okay, bad. Um, I'm <laughs> going to explain it in the next 60 seconds. Okay, good. I have a family of 10 children. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and every holiday, it is only in my family that my um, sisters-in-law, my brothers, can be able to bring their children because their children can easily be acceptable in the family. They have everybody to play with because I have one who has just finished the university and one who is going to a nursery school. <laughs> Two, when a family is big, there is always no psychological torture on the children. These are things of going for massaging and so on. For my children, they can make bottles from banana fibers and they play. Whereas for you are struggling with the TV, for them they are outside jumping, doing everything, climbing anthills and so on. Um, the other one is when you are poor and you have less children, you become extinct. I'll give an example of that's how the Nokodinka in between, who are caught up between Sudan and South Sudan are becoming extinct. They cannot go down, they cannot go up. Because, and you take them from the planning, actually I was there and I said, you people, you need to produce about 50 children each woman so that you are able to have enough force to fight off the Syria coming from uh, uh, Northern Sudan. Um, then the other one is a real life example. On my average, two brothers, one had two sons and another one had 20 of them. The one who had two sons, when he died, the two children died and even his grave has been sold. <laughs> the one who had 20 children, three of his children died, the 17 have remained and the family is going. So, Small fertility is so bad for the society. Thank you very much. <laughs> May I have this side, please? First of all, congratulations for a fabulous panel and a gender equitable panel, too. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> May I have I have your name and affiliation? I'm Carmen, Bar Bar I'm Carmen Barroso, and yes. I'm going to argue that it's neutral. And oh, no. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> It is neutral because there is an important element that uh, was mentioned by all the panelists but not sufficiently analyzed, which is the political factor and the definition of work in our societies. As long as care work is assigned only to women, women will be at a disadvantage. And as long as we ignore the fact that artificial intelligence is bringing a post-work society where most of us will be unemployed and that that will require a new social compact based on human rights where every human being is valued for being a human being and not for the work they do, there will be inactable power, inactable uh, resources, and we will all uh, suffer from that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Stan Becker, Johns Hopkins University. Um, it would good be or good. bad? Good or bad? Uh, good. Good. <laughs> it might be nice to link this to Tuesday's uh, debate. World population is increasing by 75 to 85 million per year, but we're already beyond a sustainable population. We continue to destroy our ecosystem at an alarming rate. So we need below replacement fer fertility to stabilize world population. The ecologists tell us that maybe five billion we can, we can handle sustainably. 
We have 23 million refugees in many countries that have been there many years. Many countries don't want them, we heard. There's one million people came to Germany in the last year or so. I live in the US. We have about one million legal immigrants, some of you, that are admitted per year. We have about 1.4 million more deaths, births than deaths every year because of uh, momentum. We need below replacement fertility to stabilize the US population. Finally, <laughs> having an only child is a good thing. There was a book printed uh, quite a few years ago, maybe one, by a guy named Bill McKibben, some of you may have heard of. He's gotten off the population bandwagon, but th that book documents uh, how much better single children do in families. There's some stigma in the US for couples who have an only child, but it's really been shown that only children do better vis-a-vis -vis children in larger families. But the bigger picture is we have a world population increasing by 70 to 80 million or so per year. We need to think about below replacement fertility and bringing down fertility in places where it's above. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, my name is Mehtab Karim uh, okay. from Mali University in Pakistan. Um, first of all, uh, good or bad? Well, uh, oh no, please. Good, Neutral no. good for me. It was good for me, but bad for the country where I come from. Okay, region. good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the reason I'm saying good for me because uh, I come from a family, uh, uh, ten children, uh, just like the my. I don't have 10, by the way. Uh, and I asked my father when I was in eighth grade that why did you have so many children? He was a professor, university professor trained in UK. And he said, I wanted to have too many children so that I could educate all of them and produce educated you know, uh, people in the country. But I decided then in eighth grade that I want to study demography, by the way. So it has <laughs> been good for me because I thought that there were too many um, siblings I had. But I would uh, beg to differ with uh, my uh, uh, friend, uh, Zeba Sitar, because the region I come from, or we come from, I think, uh, too many children is bad. Uh, we just had a census in Pakistan, which is still growing at the rate of 2.5%, incredibly high rate in Asia. So I would tend to, I don't want to quote all the figures. Everybody knows that uh, too many children is bad for the society. At least the region we come from, or I come from. Thank yes, you very much. Very good. Thank you. Can we have this side? Mm -hmm. uh, Jane O'Sullivan, neo Malthusian. Um, I endorse everything. Good or bad <laughs> before you continue? Good. Good. <laughs> um, I endorse what what Stan has said, and I think that we do a lot of jumping at shadows about the, the change in demographic and worrying about old age and support ratios when there's actually no evidence at all that the shift towards older demographics is going to constrain the workforce. Um, there is no shrinkage of workforce in response to ageing. So uh, all we've heard from the bad side of the argument is low fertility as a symptom of other things that are bad rather than being a bad thing in its own right, other than this support ratio, which is really an un unsubstantiated burden. We must really pay more attention to the ecology of humans and the fact that water is going to become an increasingly critical resource um, in terms of conflict and the disruption that that will create. I want to also say that the option of top-up migration is um, often left out of these discussions about low fertility meaning high support ratios, but the amount of migration that's required to stabilise the population with a fertility of the 1.5 or 1.6 is only about 0.2% of the population per annum. Um, there's no reason to think that that wouldn't be very easy to... <laughs> To, to find enough migrants to come and, and top up generations. So low fertility itself, when it's a choice, and it represents a diversity of options for people. Childlessness should be an option that people aren't pressured into thinking that they have to have children. Um, 
but having three or more should be discouraged because of the environmental footprint that that has. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sarah Randall, uh, University College London. We need to remember... Good or bad? Hey, hmm? hey, oh, good. Low fertility is very bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we need to remember that humanity has been evolving for millennia, and humans have evolved to be social beings, and this needs to begin at home in the family. Eric talks about spending his excess resources on going for a massage, but actually, that lasts for five minutes, the pleasure of the massage. <laughs> but most people, when they have one child, what does that one child do? It consumes vast amounts of stuff. It has an <laughs> iPad, it has throwaway clothes. It's actually much more ecologically unsustainable than a family of two or three children where the children entertain each other rather than needing things. <laughs> so let have your two children, have your three children, not ten, I said. <laughs> I, go, I go for a total fertility rate of two with quite a lot of childlessness, voluntary childlessness, and a number of families of three, two, three or four children. Total fertility of two, not ten. Mm -hmm. Let your family of children entertain each other, play board games. It doesn't cost anything. And they will develop social skills. They will become good human beings rather than just materialist, thing-centered creatures. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll have one and then you. We have the left-hand side again. Yeah? Yes, I'm Jean-Francois Kobiane from the University of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. And we are talking about... Good or bad, please. We are please. talking about very low, very low fertility. I say very low fertility is bad. Low fertility is good, but very low is bad. When you are look, we look at uh, the challenges uh, some countries, developed countries, or even middle-income countries are facing now in terms of replacement, I think in Sousan Africa, we need really to think about what we are actually expecting in terms of fertility trends. And uh, uh, I think there is a responsibility for scholars and supervisors to, to think on this issue of which can be a kind of optimal family size we can really actually expect to have a kind of equilibrium in terms of family interaction and interaction. So um, I think that very low fertility is bad. Very low. Okay. But low fertility is good. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, Jeroen Spijker, Center for Demographic Studies in Spain. Um, I'm absolutely for very, very, very low fertility. Yeah. I'll let you know why. Uh, my father was a father of seven and was a child with six brothers and sisters. Um, his father probably didn't, never played with him at all. I have just one son. I play with him every day. And why? Because we, in Spain, we don't have uh, work and family um, reconciliation policy, so I'm forced to pay, play my part as a father, rather than having my partner do all the stuff. So I'm also for no family policies, because that <laughs> shows that you've got, uh, it's, it's mo much more uh, equal within the, within the, the general relations are, are, are a lot better that way. So since he was, since his birth until now, 12 years, um, I've always spent an hour just with him. So I think if you have three, four, five children, what happens is then the husband will go to work and the wife will stay at home to look after those three, four, five children. And with one child, you do, you bo both husband and wife does it. So we need to look, again, also not just at the eco at ecological footprint, but also from the perspective of the child. And um, I think there are many arguments also to say that, yeah. And another context is also important because in, in Spain you go to school from the age of three, so he has... 25 brothers and sisters. He, they've been going to the same school for the last 10 years, and his, all his mates are, are, are like his brothers and sisters. So it's, it's even though demographically he's got one, one, he's got no brothers or sisters. In reality, he's got a huge amount of social support, which, uh, and he's never lonely at all. So yeah, I'm for low, low fertility. Good, good, good father. <laughs> yes, so we have this side. Uh, Wolfgang Lutz, uh, Vienna. Well, just to put a few more concrete numbers, what do we mean by very low fertility? The study that Eduardo had mentioned, uh, where we studied optimal fertility uh, 
manufacturing and also the cost and the higher productivity that's associated with education shows for Europe the optimum is between 1.5 and 1.7. But it's a relatively flat optimum, so it is, could be 1.8 or 1.2 is also all right. But this does not yet include migration and it does not yet include the environmental effects that were also mentioned. If we include them, the optimum would be still lower. Now, we are, pr are proud as demographers to have data and evidence base. I don't know a single piece of evidence in any country that very low fertility has been disadvantageously for the economy or for the social security system. All our fears are based on very simplistic models. Really, as I see the conventional old age dependency ratio and youth dependency ratio based on fixed age limits, it sh should not be used anymore. It, it's really outright silly. We can do much better looking at the actual uh, economic dependency ratios that factors in um, unemployment, for instance. Now look at these southern European countries. Italy, Spain, uh, Greece, they had their very lowest low fertility, yet today we have extremely high youth unemployment. If fertility had not been so low, youth unemployment would probably be higher. And this brings me to the last point. There are real fears now that robots take over our economy. And there's big discussions in the technology economy cycle that said there will be a job scarcity in the future, particularly for low educators. So we just need a few people who are highly skilled programmers or analysts or whatever. So the lower the fertility is and the higher the education of the people, the better everybody will do on average. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Do we have the slide? Um, Nicholas Ender, Germany's Federal Research uh, Institute for Population Research. I would like to echo Wendy Singel's argument, and I say that it's very low fertility is bad at the individual level of women because it might indicate that there are some constraints that limit the free choice of women to realize how many children they want to have. Um, it's my generation, when I look at my mother, she was 35 when she got me. Then she tried to have another child that was a miscarriage and then doctors advised her at 37 she was way too old to try again. So that's why I ended up being a single child. Um, and I'm now 38, had the first permanent job at age 37 and I'm hearing the biological clock ticking in the back <laughs> of my head louder and louder every day. And I would say that there are constraints in the labor, labor market that are acting much more strongly still on women, particularly on the higher educated, that are actually limiting the choices or the ability of a woman to realize her intentions. And we should probably pet, put a bit more emphasis on the individual level constraints for women. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gretchen Donahauer from UC Berkeley, and uh, I spend a lot of time studying the cost of children. So the amount of money that governments pay to fund education and health and general services that children uh, receive, and then how much families pay for uh, market goods and services, and then also how much families pay in terms of unpaid care work time of uh, mostly mothers, but fathers as well. And it is huge. And there is no country that is looking at a family-friendly policy or leave that gets anywhere close to that. And so what I want to say about that is the only reason we're having this debate is that there are private costs and public benefits. So the fact that when we do talk about family-friendly policies, when we do talk about uh, releasing constraints and allowing people to choose more children, no government is prepared to pay what it really costs. So if they're talking about trying to raise fertility and not pay what it costs, what they really want is free stuff. And what they really want is free stuff mostly from women. So I'm against that, so I think low fertility is good. Yeah, I'm Andrea from the University of Suriname. I uh, would like to mention that uh, when we talk about uh, very low is good or very low is bad, we have to look it at the context. We, ha are, we have a world, the world is divided in regions, and I think that every region 
has to decide its, or determine its, its policies with respect to ferry law is good or ferry law is bad. Then considering the region you have countries. Every country is a single country, has its own characteristics, has its own culture. culture. So I think thinking about policies must be for any segment in the world. And we here at the, at the conference, we have an idea of the world, but the conference consists of representatives of different countries. So I cannot say it is good or it is bad. We have to go oh, back. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, I, for my own country, I see that my country is a multi-ethnic uh, society, and all the groups has his own way of thinking. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Anybody else? Susanna Kavenag. Um, I think uh, very low fertility in the context we are right now uh, is good um, for the reasons um, Stan and uh, Jen said, but also because I think it's good for gender, and then I will um, talk to Zeb about that, because you are putting the disadvantage that we still have now uh, for, for the gender inequality that we have with very low fertility, but you didn't say the very bad disadvantages and the worst ones that we have before when we have higher fertility. So I think for, for gender, the gender perspective, very low fertility is, is good. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think you have done the same thing with your uh, disadvantages uh, for low fertility and high as you have done with your graph. Because for me, the slippery slope is from six to two is much bigger than, than two to one or two to zero. So I think you have to put a little bit balance there. So I think in the context we are right now, very low fertility is very good. Okay, thank you very much. Sir. Now we'll give uh, two minutes to the speakers. Eduardo, we'll start in order. Oh, one more. Sorry, I didn't see you. Come on. Thank you. Um, I think uh, low fertility is uh, bad because I think that, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think that uh, fertility preference show that, we, yeah, a lot of times pe people have, uh, want to have more children than they actually have. But I think, yeah, so we, so we should start at the uh, um, structural level so to see, yeah, I think we built up a society uh, with uh, pension systems that are built up on a certain number of children. And this is what is not good. It's not the families, it is a system. And also ecological prints is also on a certain uh, uh, idea that we can afford traveling, doing a lot of things. Of course, if all the people would do like this, it would destroy the world. But I think it is very dynamic. But to start to change the number of children, that uh, the family size to the e economic and ecological system that we created is not good. Um, it's rather the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we will pass. Oh no, we have one more. Uh, my last one, please. Okay. It's just short, <coughs> short reaction. One shine is okay. And when you, by, my, by unluck, you get a girl with anorexia, mental anorexia, or a boy or girl with schizophrenia, for example. Mm -hmm. And in our current society, which is charging, accusing the parents to, be, to have wrongly educated their children, mm -hmm. it is, if you only have one, you are really in trouble. And but if you have one or uh, no, another one, or a third one, second one, or third one, it, it will help you to, uh, to you know, to, mm. to live and to be not schuldig, uh, uh, guilty, guilty. Mm -hmm. So for now, until the society, 
have not improved uh, again, uh, doesn't, until she doesn't, anything, doesn't know anything about mental health at young adults, I think it's better to have two children. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So it's bad, bad, thank you. So thank you very much, thank you. Lady, are you press, press one of your buttons? You press the button, and it becomes red? Yeah, red. Thank you. Thank you for our reactions on both sides. Uh, I think this format is great. It started in Salvador when we had the IOSS meeting there, and it's always fun. I don't take personally any attack, or, and I think uh, discussions are always good. And I was glad that I didn't raise the environment point and even international migration because we had the debate, so this is good. But I did forget one point that is equally important, namely the inequality by income, the income gradient and the education gradient. So I'm in favor of low fertility. Low fertility is good, but unfortunately, low fertility follows a positive gradient. And so even in below replacement societies, uh, the state, as Gretchen pointed out about the burden of having children, the state should always take children, more so in a below replacement context, as a public good for society, rather than an individual child, family oriented. And again, we demographers, we don't discuss, I don't know the data about LGBT couples, how, most, how much of the childlessness is associated with lifestyle. We lack this kind of question, I don't know, maybe ideological reasons, but I'm a pro-individual right and choice person and we don't should mess with individual decisions in that regard. And that has nothing to do with the constraints that we discussed in the theory. It's pure choice. Um, <coughs> yes, again, thank, thank you everyone for your comments. And as Eduardo pointed out, these were not pos personal positions yeah. we were asked to argue. But I would uh, take up from my, my colleague, Dr. Natap Karim. I don't think we are talking about uh, this, the bone of contention is not about reaching 2.1 or even coming down to 1.8. I think it's really what I call the slippery slope was really beyond 1.8. Um, and I would still really, I am convinced that this would be bad for societies because I do keep thinking of the, the country Japan that we admire so much maybe, but um, the, the Japanese woman um, I think would be right a step ahead of that Korean lady really trying to be persuaded to have uh, kids, but really due to the traditional norms that exist, still continue to exist in Japan, would really resist that change. So I, I do think that um, th there's much to be argued in favor of, let's say, Finland, Sweden. These are good examples of societies that have already thought it out and not just, like you said, reacting later with very, very uh, superficial policies. The main, um, I think, argument against, I mean, the weakness in, our, in my argument were, was pointed out by Wolfgang Lutz and one or two other people, was that we don't have evidence that there are labor force shortages. Well, I would really like to just throw this out. Is that because right now we have a bunch of really quite rich, well-off societies that have reached that, that state of transition? Imagine when Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the bulk of India, when those large countries, you know, large bulk of population that is already pretty much undereducated, under unemployed, actually starts moving into the aging population. I mean, I think then you're going to get huge uh, abundance of um, evidence to support the fact that I think low fertility, very low fertility, is terribly bad for societies. Thank you. Thank you. I also come from a family of 10. <laughs> and none of my siblings, including myself, uh, has 10 children. 
uh, I have two children. If we thought that having many children uh, is a good thing, maybe one of us, one of the ten of us, will have been like our, like our uh, like my father. Uh, I wonder if you were a woman and you have carried three or four pregnancies to a full term, whether you will be singing the same tune. I, I doubt very much. But I want to be, I, I want to be pragmatic in my closing remark by, by asking you, uh, the audience, a question. And uh, before asking this question, I recognize that there are people who don't want to have children as a matter of choice. I also recognize that the issue of primary and secondary sterility or infertility, I recognize that. But having said that, for people who have children here, can you show people who have one or two children? Can I see your hands? Great. One or two children. Can I see your hand? Okay, done. For people who have three or more children, can I see your hands? That makes my point. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's important to distinguish between very low fertility and low fertility, and the fact that a lot of the interventions seem to have very different thresholds about what very low fertility is, shows that it is a social construct. And when we treat a, ca a categorical variable, a social construct, as a rigid indicator of reality, without actually putting it into context, without actually